Mohammed Hayes, Mo to his friends, runs a very successful organic vegetable farm up there. Every city has acres of flat industrial roofs. Every one of those roofs is potentially a garden. And for Mo Hayes and his colleagues at Lufa Farms, the largest and strongest ones are potentially farms. This is Lufa's first farm, the first rooftop farm in the world, in fact, in an industrial district in the northeast of Montreal. Their second one is a few kilometers away in the western suburbs. Every night, urban farmers work through the rows of fresh organic vegetables, picking to order, plucking precisely what their customers have requested. Every day, those custom boxes of vegetables are dropped off at strategic locations around the city. Lufa Farms is far from a traditional farm. In fact, Mo Hayes says it's not really a food company at all. It's a technology company. Maybe so. But still, for me, it's a peek into the future of food. Tell me why I'm dressed this way. <laughs> well, we ask, all, we ask all guests essentially to put on a Tyvek suit and, uh, and shoe covers because we're trying to minimize the number of insects that come in from the outside. Uh, we grow our food here with uh, no pesticides, herbicides or fungicides, no synthetic pesticides, herbicides or fungicides. So we try to introduce other insects into the farm to create a level of, to, to really cre create an equilibrium in the farm where all the pest pressures are maintained fairly low. So to make our job easier, we'd like not to have all the insects that are outside joining us on a regular basis. So this just helps uh, keep uh, a level of separation between the outside and the inside. Come back to what you said there, because you said you, you try to maintain a level of, uh, of benign insects, I guess, or you sure. try to maintain a kind of insect Actually community? Both. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, the key about growing food without having too many problems is to have enough insects, both good and bad. Uh, they keep themselves really busy and they, they leave the plants alone. Um, it's really funny, we, once a week we'd go in and we'd scout for all the bad insects, such as aphids. And I'm, I'm not the technical one here at LUFA, uh, but I know roughly how it works. And uh, it, we, we essentially measure the densities of, of bad insects that we have in the farm. And then we've got a, we built a small software that will allow us to uh, understand what those populations, how these populations will vary over time based on the humidity and the light levels. And we introduce insects, uh, predatory insects into the farm to balance them. Uh, things like uh, ladybugs, parasitic wasps that we actually buy from various places all over the world and they come in, in boxes that we introduce into the farm. And, uh, when, and this equilibrium allows us to have minimal losses due to pests and keeps the pest pressures fairly low. Uh, there's certain instances where we might have not enough aphids, where we might have a good population of ladybugs or parasitic wasps, but we might not have enough aphids you know, that usually attack the plants, in which case we might go and buy aphids. Uh, a different species of aphids that's not necessarily, uh, that doesn't necessarily attack tomatoes, just to maintain our army in, in good shape. Uh, in, in, in short, we're trying, to, we're trying to copy what Mother Nature's been doing all along. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're, so you're providing food for the predators in that case, right? Yeah, f and for both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but when, they, when your aphid population is sure. low, the reason for bringing it up isn't that you want aphids, it's that you want food for the predators. Absolutely, yeah, stupid. absolutely. It, it's, it, we need to have an army that's always healthy, the way we look at it. And, and if, we have, if you have a farm with absolutely no insects, you're very, very vulnerable. Uh, because the first, uh, the first sign of, of aphids or white fly, you, you could re really quickly have an infestation where if you had, uh, if you had a good level of insects in your greenhouse, uh, it really nothing changes that quickly, it just hovers around. Yeah, so it's much more effective than trying to actually prevent pests from, from getting in in the first place. Yeah, I mean, you always want to prevent new pests from coming in. You always want to be able to control what you have in, in the greenhouse. We just built a brand new farm right now that, that has a technology uh, that allows us to pass all the air through an insect screen and, and maintain a positive pressure in the farm to prevent insects from coming in. So we, we don't have to deal with the outside insects, but we still have to deal with the inside insects. But when you have two or three species, it's fairly manageable. It's more during the summertime where you have, you know, uh, dozens of species coming into the farm that becomes a little bit more challenging. Yeah. Tell me about the business model here, because uh, tell, me, no, tell me what you're trying to do, because it seems sure. to me as a consumer, I wish you were in my city. <laughs> uh, so, Lufa, I mean, it's a very basic proposition. We want to grow food where people live, and we want to grow it more sustainably, uh, using obviously no pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, no uh, capturing rainwater, recirculating all the irrigation water, so having no water or nutrient loss, composting using half the energy, half the energy of heating primarily. You know, we're in, in Montreal, you need a lot of energy for heat, and more importantly, using no new land. 
so about seven years ago, um, we started working on, on this new concept, and it was a very challenging project. You know, people looked at us and said, you're crazy. You have no background in, in, in plant science, in architecture, in growing food, in distribution, uh, yet to, you want to reinvent the way we, we look at food, the way we grow food, the way we distribute food. Uh, and when we looked at it, in the early on, the project was a bit of a, a child's dream, you know, uh, a bit of an idealist uh, view of, of how food should be. Food should be grown in the cities. Food should be grown perfectly by local people. Should be brought to me the same morning it's harvested. And we went from that idea into this uh, through a tremendous amount of innovations and hard work. And we had to just rethink the way we did our crop planning, the way we managed the farm, the way we think of distribution. And, and software has been at the heart of all this. I mean, I like to think that it's thanks to technology that we can grow in a more natural way. What an interesting concept, you know, that you, the, the technology allows you to, <coughs> to be more natural. People walk into the farm and the first thing they, they see, they see, they see us wearing Tyvek suits, they see software, they see people with laptops, iPads, and they go, well, is this really natural? You know, you're, you're, there's, it's too controlled. Uh, we like to think that we pick the best of the best technologies, but but technology we cannot do it without. I mean, we, um, you know, I, I, when I look at the challenge we have here today, if we did, if it wasn't for the software that managed our microclimates, that give us a, a different uh, temperature and humidity and irrigation for each group of plants, we wouldn't be able to grow without. Uh, we don't. We wouldn't be able to grow in polyculture. We'd be growing in monoculture. So technology allow, enables that. Uh, the fact that we're able to, uh, if someone harvests a head of lettuce automatically know that, that lettuce is in demand and, and, and schedule more lettuce for planting. Um, so technology allows us to have a, a seed to table type process where we understand our customers, we understand their needs, we understand the, the cropping cycles of the plants and we're able to create a dynamic growing system that, that self-adjusts really. Um, so there's a number of different areas that, that where we've implemented technologies to simplify our operations, make sure that we're also more efficient. Efficiency is incredibly important. At the end of the day, we need to make sure that our food is not only amazing, it's affordable. And that's a direct, there's a direct correlation between that and, and efficiency. So we work very hard to, 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 to make sure that uh, we're, we're, we're monitoring our costs, we're monitoring our, our efficiencies, and we're able to deliver food that's competitively priced. Who is your typical consumer? Our, our typical customer is, is a, a Montrealer, a, a local person that loves good food and understands sustainability. Uh, I think we, we only sell our food to consumers in a, in a bit of a subscription type model. Um, so you get a weekly basket from Lufa, uh, you're able to, um, to see what's in your basket and change the content of your basket. Uh, you, we start off with the Lufa veggies and we complement our production with uh, the productions of about 40 different farms that, that are all in the area. Uh, that share the same vision of sustainability as Lufa. So these are potato, carrots, beets, onion farms. Uh, and we have a few uh, local food artisans that will, will uh, bake your bread at midnight for your basket. Uh, soon we'll have cheeses and, and local eggs as well. So the idea is, is, is not, only do we have, not only do we sell our own food, but we also try to bring together the best, the treasures of, of, of the local community over to our customers. And we have customers from really all, uh, you know, all ages, uh, sexes, uh, races, I think we, everyone eats, that's what we found out. <laughs> <laughs> of course, but, but some care very much about it. Sure, I think you, we have really two uh, very strong segments. You've got the foodies and you've got the environmentalists. And I think, uh, you know, people love the project for, some people adore the project for its environmental advantages and some people just love it for the food. Uh, we do a lot of tastings. Uh, we do a lot of open houses. We've had over 10,000 people visit the farm. We've been in operations for over three years. And we've had over 10,000 pe people visit the farm to date. We do open houses on a regular basis. And people get a chance to visit the farm. They get a chance to really hear our story, but more importantly, taste our food. And and this is really how uh, we've been able to, uh, to, this is really essentially what does all of our sales and marketing. It's, it's people really tasting the food and, and seeing the farm, seeing the project. Today we, we're shipping about 2,500 baskets. So we feed about 5,000 Montrealers uh, with food that's grown locally. And uh, even though it's a small percentage, we look at it as, as a good start. And, and we, our, our hopes are to turn an entire cities uh, self-sufficient with their food production. We know that what we're doing today is replicable. Uh, we know that there's enough roofs in Montreal and, and almost any city to be able to grow a good portion of our fresh produce, if not all of our fresh produce, locally, uh, and a number of root vegetables as well. We haven't gotten in, into that yet. Are you going to be doing that in, also indoors in a, in a greenhouse setting, the root vegetables? We, we definitely can. We've tried with radishes, we've tried with beets, and we know that it's, it's a question of uh, 
a lot of the crops that we grow today are the crops that are known for to be grown in greenhouses. But you, you essentially can grow anything. It's just a question of, of really understanding how to grow it, what, what, what are the conditions needed to grow this, this crop. So we, we grow radish really well, we grow onions fairly well. Uh, we ran out of space very quickly in our first farm, which, we, which is why we're looking uh, to expand the project right now. Now you have a, quite a range of vegetables and also quite a range of varieties within each vegetable sure. itself. Tell me a bit about that. Sure. The key, I mean, if, if we're going to be able to grow, if we're going to grow food uh, locally, we might as well pick varieties that are amazing. Uh, and the way we see it, it's not the varieties that you find in the grocery store that were bred to be tough. Uh, transportable um, and essentially tasteless um, because when, when your taste has never been a factor in, in, in cultivar selection for a commercial farm. In our farm we get it we, we're working directly with the customers and we have a direct feedback on as to what varieties they like. Uh, so for example we're uh, we just planted our new farm and with the new farm we're gonna have 23 varieties of tomatoes. Over half of them are heirloom varieties which tend to grow really well in farms but they tend to be very challenging for distribution. Uh, they're very tender, they're very soft, uh, they're, they're uneven. You'll have one tomato that's tiny, one tomato that's massive. So for a commercial grower, that's not always something that's very uh, workable. But for us, because of our direct link with the customer, it makes it, very, uh, it, makes it a great option. So we experiment a lot with cultivars. We, we, every time we change our crops, we, ha we, we plant new seeds. Uh, and the idea is to be able to bring variety to our customers, but also to try to identify uh, exceptional exceptionally tasting produce. Uh, walking in Lufa is like walking in a living grocery store to a certain extent. You know, you've got your tomatoes, you've got your cucumber, peppers, herbs, bok choy, uh, lettuces. We have uh, about a, over a dozen microgreens. We had strawberries not too long ago. Um, so we're always trying to experiment and bring in new crops. And we're hoping that over time we'll be able to even grow, uh, to, to expand that list. Well, you were, I think I read somewhere that you were already doing something with more than 40 different vegetables. We, uh, between now, between this farm and the second farm, our overall cultivar list will be, uh, I think, about 120, 130 different cultivars, yeah. One thing that really strikes me is, is your, you've said over, uh, already two or three times, amazing food, good tasting food, the taste sells the food and so forth. You know, this is a, one of the things I've always noticed is that in an awful lot of environmentally friendly farming, the food doesn't taste that good. You know, it, it, uh, the idea that, you're, that taste is one of your large criteria, I think, is, is a bit of an innovation in itself. Well, I mean, it, it needs to be. This is what we're eating food for, I think. And, and it's really interesting. We've found, people ask all the time, um, what's, what, what's the correlation between taste and, and growing methods? And the way we explain it is, you've got seed. So choosing the right cultivar. We actually have one variety. I don't know if we have it still, but we had one variety here that just doesn't taste good. You know, we planted it, we tried it, uh, we, all the team tasted it, and we just realized this is not a t good tasting tomato. <laughs> so tomatoes taste very, very different uh, one from the other. So you, you have to choose the right seeds. The second item is really making sure that you're growing properly. Uh, you're giving the plant all the nutrients that it needs. A plant without nutrients will always have nutrient deficiencies, will never grow correctly, will never form correctly, the fruit will never be uh, as tasty. So you have to make sure that you have good growing practices. We monitor our water on a, on a weekly basis. Again, the notion of science, we do a, a water analysis on a weekly basis to understand exactly what nutrients are in the water, what nutrients are missing, and we're able to add to our water the nutrients that, that the plant needs. This way we maintain a good balance of all the nutrients and the plants will be healthy at all times and they'll have exactly what they need. And finally, it's, it's harvest, uh, harvesting things like tomatoes when they're truly mature. Uh, you'll, have, you'll see about a two to three week delay between a green tomato and a very red ripe tomato ready for eating. Uh, and we harvest them, we harvest every morning only the red ones for the day's baskets where most tomatoes that you buy in the grocery store were harvested green and ripened through, that, through the, 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 the process of, of transportation, shipping, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, they'll, they'll be red, but they won't have the same sugars, the same vitamins and nutrients as a tomato that was, uh, that was vine ripened. And it's more expensive. Tomatoes, the, vine, the ripening process is expensive for the plant. It costs time, it costs money, uh, but it, it creates a far better tomato. Um, so it's really simple. Pick good seeds from a good grower, and make sure they're harvesting them fresh. <laughs> well, it's taken you years to actually get it all. It may, be, it may be simple in its essence, but doing it's not simple, right? The, the, oh, this entire project is, uh, there isn't a single challenge that, that's, not, that's not surmountable. It, it, all the challenges are feasible, but there's so many of them, in, and in serial. I mean, when we, started, when we first started 
attacking this idea, we, we attacked the architecture and engineering aspect of it. We said, well, greenhouses were built to be on the ground. Uh, they were never built to be under national building codes. How can you take this structure that's not suited for a, con a construction on a building and put it on a building? So we worked with engineers and architects uh, for over a year and a half to design the structure that you see today. We actually have three designs now. Uh, so this is, we have three iterations of structures. With each one, there's, um, there's improvements, there's reduction in costs, simplification of installation. Uh, and that was the first challenge. And the project was abandoned twice during that process. I remember a time when, I remember a time when my architect called me and said, you know, Mo, you're a great guy and you've got a you know, great idea, but to be honest, it just doesn't make sense anymore. You know, I think you know, for your own good, I think you should drop this. And, and we had several scenarios like that where it just didn't seem like, like as if this was actually feasible. When we completed, the, the, when, we, when we were confident that we had a structure that we could install in the city, the next process, next challenge we took on was how do you grow responsibly? We knew at the time that we, uh, we, knew at the time that we, we, we had to reinvent the way we grow food. We couldn't use pesticides. Uh, we couldn't uh, essentially use the same amount of energy and heating that a typical farm was using. We had to grow in polyculture because we wanted to have that direct link with the customer and we couldn't just, we can't do it with just tomatoes. Um, and, and we knew that we had to find a more efficient, more effective way to do polyculture in a farm. Uh, so we, we rented out a farm at McGill University here in Montreal for two years and we just started farming. And we planted a little bit of everything. Uh, Lauren, who runs the farm, she's a co-founder and she's, she just took on this challenge as her, you know, her challenge. And, uh, and we experimented and the crops didn't look very good in the first year, looked a lot better in the second year. We did cultivar tests, we did taste tests, we analyzed the nutrients in tomatoes. We really understood that what it would take to grow good food and, and whether or not we could do it in, in, a, in a commercial style. And when we launched our first farm, I mean, the learning continues, obviously, but we were, we were comfortable enough that we could put it up and running and, and get going uh, farming this way. Uh, as this, farm. this farm, exactly. And, and as time progressed, we were able to set up more technologies, more processes, the team evolved. Uh, and I think we're at a point now where we're confident that we're, we're, we've, this works. You know, polyculture, growing food without pesticides, recirculating water, composting, using less energy, and creating a workflow that allows us to harvest in the morning for, 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 uh, for baskets or for deliveries same day. Yeah, I want to make sure that we get that, that we get that in here, that what happens is you've got red ripe tomatoes here. Tomorrow morning, people will harvest them. And tomorrow, the consumer will eat them if he wants to. I don't know who said this, but someone said that uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, and you know, we like to look at what we're doing today as magic. I mean, we, as a customer, uh, you're, you, you, you're able to log on to our website and customize your basket. And you'll say, you know, I want tomatoes, and I'm, because I'm getting a whole bunch of Italians over, I'm going to get some basil, and I'm, I'm going to get some Lebanese cucumber, and I want a bread, a honey, some cheese, and some, sw some Swiss chard. And, and essentially, you have till midnight to customize your basket. And at midnight, all the action happens. So at midnight, uh, we lock up the order, so you can no longer play with your basket, and we send off emails to all the people involved. So our harvest team get an email at midnight telling them what they need to pick for the day. Our baker starts baking at 1 a.m. exactly what was ordered for that customer. And everything comes together around 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning uh, in a small space we have in the building here where we assemble boxes. We assemble up to six, 700 boxes per day now. And, and we bring it to our consumers in bulk. So we put up bo boxes on, on pallets and we have three trucks, which we're not very proud of, but we're feeding a good number of people now with them. Uh, we bring them to drop-off points, and we have 120 drop-off points in Montreal uh, in bulk. Every, every delivery is about 20 boxes, and customers start picking up their boxes as of 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and they've got till evening to pick up their box. Essentially, you're picking up a box of vegetables and foods that was harvested and made, custom order to you this, this same day. It's an, amazing, it's an amazing accomplishment to be able to... That's a logistical challenge of the first water, isn't it? In, in essentially, it, when you look at it this way, it does look daunting, but it actually it's incredibly simple. The fact that you're not, the fact that this is your warehouse, this is your fridge, uh, you're harvesting what you need, the baker is baking what, what, what you need, makes it very, very simple. I think there's a, there's a lot of love in, this, in, in, in doing this. People take pride in the fact that they're waking up at midnight, they're coming in here at 4 and 5 a.m. in the morning to harvest food for you. And I think, I think that's really the, the sense that, that 
that's why it works because you've got people that are incredibly passionate you've got people that are very proud of what they what they're doing what they're producing and people that want to make sure that that they're part of 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 a new way of eating new way of, of eating food i mean i'm I'm Lebanese originally, and I'm very, very lucky to have grown in Lebanon where this is how we ate. Uh, bread was always warm when you bought it. I, uh, meat came off, uh, came off the cow. You know, you went to the butcher, and then he just would cut up the cut of meat that you needed. And sometimes there was no meat because he didn't, you know, he didn't cut a cow that day. Um, essentially, I mean, I, I was like, I'm lucky enough to know what food was like and what food tasted like. And what we're trying to do here is, is recreate that experience, uh, better food, uh, local food from people you know. Uh, people here can say that I know who my, who my farmer is, I know who my, my baker is, and, and I know what ingredients they're using, how they're doing it, and I've visited them, and I've been to their open houses, and I've talked to them by phone. And I've, so this is, it's, a, it's a much richer food experience overall. Mm. You're basically starting from your, your village experience in Lebanon and skipping the industrial period and getting straight back to it in a sort of post-industrial kind of fashion, right? Well, it, it's really funny because it's the industrial period that got me into the space. So, uh, when I, when I, I mean, I grew up in Lebanon in a, in a village called Wirdani, which is a very small village. Uh, I think at the time there were 200 homes and all of my cousins and my, my uncles and everyone in my family is in farming. I mean, it's a farming village. And, and I'm lucky enough to have, grown, to have really seen farming back when it worked, back before the Green Revolution. I mean, my, my grandmother put nine of her kids through university thanks to farming. She did everything. She grew lo local food, she distributed locally, she never used pesticides because I don't think they were invented at the time. <laughs> or they, were, they weren't affordable. And the farming really worked and the food was amazing and everyone knew my, my grandma and everyone could rely on her food. And, 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 and I've seen the transition towards the Green Revolution, where now if you go to Lebanon, if you go to Wardani, my village, all you see is monoculture farms. Uh, people growing tomatoes, eggplants, cucumbers in these massive farms, using a tremendous amount of pesticide, imported labor, and selling their food to food terminals, and they're not making a living. You know, they have one good year, they have four bad years. And when I came here to Canada, all of my, all of my cousins were telling me, look at technologies, try and find something that could help us. We're suffering here. And, and I, I did exactly that. I went out and I started talking to all the big ag agro companies, visit, visiting a lot of farms. And that was very challenging, by the way. It's, visiting farms is not easy. No one wants you to visit their farm. <laughs> it was very challenging for me to actually enter farms. They were essentially big, I like to call them big black boxes. They're the secret, you know, secret spaces, but so I started... it's all proprietary information? That it's all proprietary. Thing? It's, you know, it's... I never really understood why it was so challenging to, I mean, to come visit a farm. <laughs> it's farming. There's, it's, but I started doing all this. I started researching, and I started talking to a lot of farmers in North America, and it was really funny because no one here, everyone was saying the same thing. They said, farming in North America doesn't work that it's heavily subsidized and we still can't make it work. We use a ton of energy in the winter time to heat our greenhouses or we don't grow in the winter time. Uh, transportation is a major challenge because we're, we're bringing our food far away from our farms and sometimes you know, if you're in Quebec you have to ship all the way to the US and vice versa. Um, they said it's hard to find labor. They said no one, Canadians don't want, want to work in farms. So we have to go to uh, Mexico and Guatemala and uh, bring folks in, house them, and, and it just you know, it, and it didn't work. And, and they said growing food without pesticide was impossible. So you have to use pesticides, otherwise you lose your crops. So it was a very sad, somber type uh, you know, of a situation. And to me, that's really what, what was exciting is, you know, at that time, I had talked to so many people that I knew we had a tremendous, no tremendous amount of challenges growing food locally. And I knew that food had no taste locally because I had stopped eating tomatoes when I came here. And at the same time, I knew that there were folks, you know, all over the world that are working on, on, on better things. You know, in Holland, they were, there's a company called Copper, a company called, in France called Biobest that are making uh, shippable insects that you can buy online, that you can introduce in your farm. And these insects allow you to grow food without pesticides. In California, uh, bec primarily because water is so scarce, they learned how to recirculate water and recirculate it at 100% so they, they don't lose any water. We knew, uh, I knew of one person who was crazy enough to grow in polyculture, and he was down in Anguilla. Uh, so, so really, it was starting to take shape. And, and, and you know, at some point, I think I realized that, hey, you know, universities have roofed up farms where they do research. Uh, so what if you brought all this together? It was a bit of a, an iPod moment where, you know, uh, you, 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 you know, iPod didn't really invent any technologies. They brought, them all, they brought existing technologies together, and they patched them incredibly well. So we were at a point where we said, all right, what if we do rooftop farms? You know, what if we did polyculture? 
what if we did, uh, what if we grew without pesticides and managed water more effectively? And the CSA movement was fairly big at the time. Uh, what if we just took the CSA program, uh, renovated it, implemented a lot more flexibility, a lot more software, a lot more user, user communication into it, and created a new package for food? Uh, so this is really how you know, the project came together. And my interest in, in, in all of this was, was ignited by the fact that I was looking for new structure, new technologies to help address the challenges that my cousins were facing uh, in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a fascinating evolution? <laughs> now, how much of this it can actually be exported to Lebanon? I mean, how much is this actually helping? It's helping Montrealers, but is sure. it helping your family? You know, it, it's funny. Uh, the, 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 this concept is exportable anywhere. I mean, we, any city that has rooftop space, um, you're able to come in, set up shop, farm on the roofs, uh, and essentially farm on the roofs and, 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 uh, and produce locally. The challenge that we have now is the cost of the technology is still too high. It just, you cannot justify it with the, with the price of food in Lebanon. You, you'll never be able to make it viable. And that's the challenge we have today. I mean, my, our vision here is to be able to tell our customers five years down the line, 10 years down the line, eat local because it's better for you and it's cheaper. Uh, we do believe that by, by farming more efficiently, by using less land, less resources, you can produce food that's, that's better in quality, but also more, more affordable. So today, we find that it's suited for North America, it's suited for Europe, but we still don't believe that it's, it's we've brought down the, 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 the cost of the technology enough to be able to implement it profitably uh, in, in, in areas like Lebanon or Bangladesh. I have a Bangladeshi friend that says, you know what, you have to come to Bangladesh. We have, we ran out of land, which is <laughs> essentially it, but we have lots of roofs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would be ideal for that. Well, it ought to be cheaper, shouldn't it? Because you're not doing you know, all, all, you, using all that energy to ship at sure. great distances. You're not having to warehouse it. You're not having to sure. distribute it. We have it. no you losses. We have no fairly, almost no packaging. We do run with far less, far less resources. The biggest challenge for us still is the fact that it costs a lot more to build farms on rooftops than it does to, to build them on the ground. Uh, so I like to think of what we're doing as a brand new industry. When you look at the solar industry, uh, they started off at something along the lines of four or five dollars a watt, and I think if not, I'm not mistaken, they're down to about a dollar a watt. I mean, so as the technology matures and it becomes an industry, and there's more players in the space, and the players are more, uh, essentially their, their, their systems are more refined, uh, the cost of the technology will drop. And, and we are already seeing that our, our, the, our new farm was significantly cheaper per square foot to per square meter to build than the first farm. And that trend, that trend will continue over time. And eventually we'd, we'd like to get it to the point where it's just as expensive or just as cheap to put a farm on, on a rooftop than it is to put it on the ground. Now in the new one, do I understand that the, the, the building was built with this as part of the design in the first place? We look for rooftop space that's, that's available, that's suitable, but we also work with developers to, to design the buildings before they're built so that they can include the right weights and the right loads and the right transfer points uh, to be able to, 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 take, uh, to take on a, a rooftop farm. And the advantage there is we're able to really maximize uh, the space. I mean, when we look at, at, our, at this space here, we occupy about 75% of the rooftop, where in our new farm, we occupy about 90% of the rooftop. So we have much bigger farms. Uh, they're more, far more efficient, and the building is more efficient because what happens to the building is you insulate the building. So by, by occupying a bigger area, you're, you're literally creating a big uh, blanket on top of the building, which cuts down the energy consumption of the building uh, in the wintertime quite a bit. And in the summertime, because you have a nice, cool space instead of a black tar heating mat, you're reducing the, 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 the cooling requirements for the building below as well. So there's, there's benefits for both uh, the building and the greenhouse of this merger. In greenhouses, I like to think of them as clothes. Uh, in the wintertime, you can put a big jacket. In the wintertime, we close our greenhouse. We put, a, we put energy curtains and they, they capture the sun and they heat, up, they heat up the building and they heat up the space. And in the summertime, it's like having a t-shirt where you know, your vents are wide open, you're cooling the farm, the plants are cooling the space, and, and we're able to maintain temperatures in the farm that are cooler than the outside, which is, which is quite, quite remarkable. It's almost like a glass forest, isn't it? That it like the, the forest has the same effect. The forest will give you the, the same cooling effect. Uh, it, it won't necessarily give you this, the heat retention effect. Uh, the glass gives you that heat retention effect in the wintertime. In, in, a, in, a, in the wintertime, when you walk in and it's sunny, even if it was minus 20, minus 30 degrees outside, we, we don't use any heat. The sun, uh, the solar gain, I mean, the plants will, will take up about 15% of, of the solar energy. The rest goes into heat. So by making sure our, our, our curtains are closed, we're able to use up a lot of, to use that heat to, to maintain the temperature we need. 
Uh, and a lot of times we have to vent in very sunny days in the wintertime. We have to actually let a bit of cooler in uh, because the heat builds up so much. The solar gain is, is that, that significant. And, so it's, and that's another one of these lovely integrations, isn't it? The building itself benefits from having the, the farm on the roof. We, we did a, a, a calculation. We estimate that this building will save 25 to 30 percent of its energy, of its heating energy cost, uh, with this farm being on top. Wow. Yeah. You're doing continuous technology, continuous research, and continuous development. Huh? Um, what are the challenges you're dealing with now? What are they? I mean, you've obviously got sure. this thing up and running, but sure. I gather that this is not the point where you're going to rest or stop. You're moving on. We see ourselves primarily as a technology company. Uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, what we are trying to develop is a new way to grow and distribute food, a new way to connect people with their, with their farmers. And, and we see that as a, as a, as a, as a, we do see it as a technology company. I think some of the major challenges were, that we're addressing right now is how do you scale this business and maintain uh, the same level of efficiencies and, and, and the same experience in each team. So our vision for farming is, is, is centralized, uh, cloud-based, software-driven. So we're just setting up right now our network operations center, which will allow us to manage our future farms uh, from our, our site here. So we'll be able to, because essentially when you're looking at, at urban farms, they will never be your mega multi-acre farms that you find in a lot, lot of the uh, commercial spaces out there. They will always be smaller farms with smaller teams. And it's not always justified in a small farm to have a biochemist, to have a plant scientist, an entomologist. So what our view of doing this is to have a central team that can manage and support all of our farms remotely. So uh, remote monitoring, two-way communication, uh, a number of software. So a lot of effort is being put right now to develop our network operations center and our suite of software that will enable our supervisors in all of these farms, hopefully across the world, to apply the same principles that we have learned here today. It's a, this is really very much a network model, right? Absolutely. And which is, which is again, I mean, this is an interesting period because networking seems to have come into its own in the last 10 years. And the other farm you can really see is kind of like a command and control monolithic, not only monocultural, but monolithic. Sure. Sort of the, the, really we, visited, we visited a lot of farms, and, and what was really interesting is every time we'd meet a grower or a farmer, they would tell us that farming is, is part science, part art. We actually believe that farming is part science, part science. Uh, and I think we won't trust till, 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 till we, we can truly uh, apply, it, apply the science principles to it. And we think that science is very reproducible, it's very predictable, and it will allow us to, to scale the model. Uh, so the vision is to, to understand what it would take to grow good food, the, the, from the cultivars, to the crop cycles, to the, our pest management tools, and, and create the structure, the network, for, of both people and tools and software that will allow us to apply it fairly inexpensively and roll it out in masses uh, globally. So if we have a, a farm in France, uh, it would still be managed by the, time here, by the, by the team here. That's the vision for Louvre. Yeah, but you've also got a local team in France. Do you think yeah. of franchising? Because it's, or is it, is, is there a franchise piece of this model? I, I think eventually, ultimately, as our technology matures and we're able to, we are able to package it out, the number of models become become really interesting. Franchising, licensing. Uh, the vision for us is to partner up with 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 entrepreneurs and 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 operators that that can carry the vision and apply it. But we're still early on. We're still at the stage where we we need to develop more tools. We need to prove the concept. We need to build a few more farms in a few cities ourselves, operate them ourselves, and demonstrate that this is perfectly viable. Uh, I mean, I, I, one company that I admire uh, is, is Tesla Motors, where they're building their, their, their cars, but they're also starting to support other companies and, and providing them with the drivetrains for their cars. I think they're working with Toyota and, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Mercedes on, on these cars. So we like to think of ourselves as, as building our own concept, selling straight to the consumer, uh, the refining our technology, but ultimately working with, with, with great entrepreneurs, great visionaries, to expand the model in, 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 in cities. I and mean, we can do this, we can create an industry by ourselves. Here's another question, here you are. You grew up in Lebanon, came to Canada when you were how old? 12. 12, yeah. okay, so now you're in Canada as a teenager. You're not more than double that now, or not a lot more than double that oh. now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I you're just, I just celebrated guy. my 32 years. <laughs> 32 there you go, <laughs> See, so, okay, so twice 16, you're 32. <laughs> not everybody at 16, uh, well, number one, people have to have the vision, but, the, but I think lots of people have the vision, but you've also somehow had the business chops to get it done. This is not something you did out of your, 
out of your own pocket. This is something that required a, a sure. whole business. And tell me how that worked for you. Sure. I mean, I, I, I had previous experiences before. I ran a software company for a number of years, so I was exposed to business in general. But this project was nothing like I had ever expected. I mean, from a challenge perspective. <laughs> and I think what, what really made it work for us is the fact that we have an amazing team. You know, early on, uh, when, when you know, I had this aha moment about seven years ago, uh, and, and the first thing that I did was bring together an amazing team. And I think this is, you know, the, my best accomplishment is, 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 is hiring the best people. You know, I think uh, we have some of the best people working at Lufa and they're incredibly motivated, incredibly energetic. They come in with various experiences. Uh, just to give you an idea, we, uh, you know, I, I brought in uh, my right hand in communication, someone called Kurt Lynn, uh, you know, who had a lot of experiences. Uh, creating businesses, business plans, and communications. Uh, he was one of the first to join me on the project. Uh, a good friend of mine was a general contractor who just loved challenging projects, and he loved, he just loved the impossible. He's one of those guys who says, I can do it. And, and this was perfect for him. Uh, Lauren, who was a fresh grad from McGill uh, by, in biochemistry, was eager to take on a world-changing challenge and something that's, that's new. And finally, we went to, uh, uh, we went to Anguilla, and we brought from Anguilla uh, Howard, who's a, a, a PhD in plant science, and he was this crazy guy in Anguilla operating a 20,000 square foot farm, applying, growing 40, 50 different varieties of food uh, for a hotel uh, because they couldn't import their food. So there was a great fit. Uh, the team really kind of, we, 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 we worked together for a number of years to, to make this happen. And we brought in more people uh, over, over the years. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, one of my partners joined me, uh, he's, who's, who's an, uh, who ran a venture, uh, a venture capital fund. And he's, he just understands finance, understands how to take this project, for, which, is, which is hard to finance because you're spending a lot of money building these farms. Um, so he's been a key member that's helping us in the, in the expansion of LUFA and, and, and trying to find a way that the, the, the financing of our future farms is, is efficient, <laughs> uh, because, which is another challenge in, in its own. Uh, so I think, I mean, and, and, and it's, it's definitely a challenge worth taking. It's, a, it's an unbelievable problem to, to solve. And, and you know, if we can do it, we can revolutionize the way we eat. And we can also revolutionize the way cities are developed. Uh, so it's incredibly exciting, and it hasn't been easy, and, and it's still not easy, but it, it's, it's a challenge really worth taking. And I think we're all, we all look at this as a, both as a, as, as, as a professional job, but also as a, an unbelievable personal uh, endeavor. Yeah. And it sounds to me as though you're just having a whole lot of fun. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, in among all the challenges. But oh sure, sure. I mean, I think this this is for me personally. I, I'm I'm a geek and I love technology, and, and I love accomplishment and, and I love taking on new challenges. And this just brings it all together. This is my hobby first and, and my work second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me come come back to the financing. Where does where does your your guy find the actual money? Does he do? Are we talking here in terms of of uh, well, not IPOs, but in terms sure. of, of equity offerings, sure. way back up at the beginning. Sure. Even? The, the, so the first project was almost impossible to finance. It was actually, you know, family and friends. It's a lot of love money that put it together. Uh, we did successfully raise our first round of financing last year, and and it was there's a, a really an interesting shift in mentalities. Uh, about three years ago, people looked at us as crazy. People just said, you know what, uh, you know, we've seen this before, you guys, you know, a lot of companies have tried to do it before, a lot of individuals have tried to do it before, it just doesn't work, you know. Uh, it doesn't work, it's too challenging, it's not an easy project, really no one believed that we could do it. Uh, when we built the first farm, we started to get credibility. We, people started looking at this and saying, well, maybe there's something there. <laughs> and, 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 you know, we still couldn't get a lot of the banks interested because banks like, you know, they like secure, structured, long-term uh, businesses. But we were lucky enough to have, uh, to, to have found partners uh, on the financing side that really both understood the vision and that were willing to commit uh, their funds and, and their, uh, their support uh, and line up behind it. So we raised our first round uh, of, of financing, which allowed us to build our, our second farm and, 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 and some of the uh, next farms. Um, so we did that last year. Now we're at a point where we've got two farms and, and companies and banks are starting to look at this a little bit differently. So I think it's a very natural uh, progression. Uh, it's, it's very similar to many other industries where you know, when early on you're, you are on the bleeding edge. <laughs> Whether you, you, know, you like it or not, it's, it's, you're on the, and then quickly you're on the leading edge. And, and I think you know, when, when we're, we're at, the, at the stage now where we're entering that space and people are realizing that this makes sense. I mean, what's interesting about LUFA is we feel as if we're on a race 
um, where the finish line is coming towards us. You know, tomorrow, our business will make even more sense. You know, we're, 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 we're not shrinking as a population. We're, we, we have fewer resources, less land, less water, less energy. People are more demanding of what they're eating. Uh, so what's really interesting is if we can make it work today, it'll work even better tomorrow. And, and that's incredibly exciting. Even in the six, seven years that I've been working on this, I've seen, people's, I've seen people go from, that's interesting, to this is a no-brainer. Isn't that interesting that they've, that they've done that? Because, yeah, it seems to me that any of those dimensions that you just discussed, energy, for example, if you look at something like this, by comparison with a huge monoculture using all kinds of petrochemical sure. stuff, it's obvious, isn't it? The energy equation is, is probably the strongest. We, from a heating perspective, the, the number one expense for a greenhouse in Quebec or in Canada is heating because it, it just costs a lot of energy to heat your greenhouses. We get about half of our energy from the farm, from the space below. Essentially, every dollar that's used to heat the building, we will get. <laughs> so we start off with a platform uh, that has a temperature of, of, I would like to say, Toronto or Boston. So it's much warmer to start off with than if we were just out in the field. Uh, and cities, what's interesting about cities is they, uh, th th so the worst, the coldest time of the day is 4 a.m. in the morning. Not for us. It comes at about 6 a.m. in the morning where we have a little bit of sun and a little bit of light coming in to, to combat that. And the reason for that is cities will retain heat a lot better than fields. Uh, buildings and, and masses and concrete masses will retain quite a bit of that heat. So overall, from an energy perspective, this is the best place to be growing food. It just makes a lot of sense. Not to mention we get about $600,000 of free solar energy every year from the sun. So, so rooftops, I like to think of rooftop spaces as the sexiest part of the building. It's just, they just, it, they make a ton of sense. So, so that's from a growing perspective. From a distribution perspective, you're right, you're, you're in, you're, you're within your customer base. So you're, you're doing such a short travel distance to go to your customers. Eliminating losses, we have no loss. We have zero loss in the farm because we're harvesting what we need for the day. And whatever is imperfect, we still sell to our customers as imperfect. And customers love it because it's better value. Uh, so nothing is wasted. Our policy is nothing is wasted. And that, when you look at that versus the traditional model where you know, anywhere from 30 to 40% of the food is wasted, well, look at the carbon cycle and how that affects the carbon cycle. It, it's incredibly, uh, it, it, it's incredibly impactful to be able to use up 100% of your production. So there's a number of, of, of energy uh, benefits. Uh, land is another big one. I mean, we, we farm using no new land. You know, this space here 40 years ago was a farm. Yeah, and then, you know, for 37 years, this industrial building occupied that space. This entire area was dezoned. Uh, it became industrial and all of these industrial buildings popped up. So, but now it's once again a farm and it's a different kind of farm. So we, we like to think of, of this model as yeah, uh, really just, you know, the reason why the company is called Lufa. I mean, that's, it kind of takes us back. I mean, six, seven years ago, we we're looking for a name for the company. And, and loofahs couldn't, you know, I kept thinking of, of the plant, the loofah, because in Lebanon, this plant grows up on the side of the building. I don't think we grew it there. I think it just grows by itself. And it occupies the entire rooftop space. And my mom, you know, sets up these trellises to support it because we love it, because it shades the building, it cools down the building. It gives us a squash that my mom will use for cooking. And we'd eat loofahs for a really long time. And when the plant, when the fruit becomes so big, uh, we'd, my mom would let it dry up and would make the loofah sponges that we'd use uh, for bathing. So here's this plant that just sits there in a corner, never bothers anyone, uses you know, absolutely ignored spaces, and gives us food, cools down the building. So when we look at loofah, we look at, at uh, you know, what we're doing today, we see a lot of parallels with the plant. We're taking up ignored spaces, spaces that, that really were heat islands, absorbing a lot of heat, not serving uh, the building or the city or the, the occupants uh, very much. And we transform them into lush green spaces. We grow food, we hire people, we pay taxes, which is another big problem, <laughs> 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 paying that much taxes. Yeah. Uh, and, and we do it really without asking for much, much in exchange. That sounds splendid. So your vision is that ultimately this is a concept that you, that, uh, you develop, and I guess others el elsewhere are working on similar sorts of yeah. things, but, but you develop that and it spreads worldwide. And, uh, and you're able to, uh, to help to feed this vast army of people that we've, we've produced. I mean, we, we definitely believe that this is the future for, for fresh food. Uh, I mean, we in Montreal, we know that it takes, we did the calculation and it takes about 19 roofs, uh, the roofs of 19 shopping centers to turn a city like Montreal self-sufficient with its food production from a fresh vegetable perspective, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and lettuces. And we do have 19 shopping centers. <laughs> so. 
the, 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 when you look at, at the implications, you can turn cities self-sufficient with their food production. And when you look at, at, at North America, we have plenty of industrial warehouse, commercial roofs that would be just perfect for, for doing this kind of, 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 of model. So we truly believe that this is the future. Uh, we think today the cost of the technology is still a barrier. Uh, but as, like it was for the electric car or solar panels, but as time progresses and we're able to innovate, and in parallel to that, as, as energy cost rises, uh, I, think, I think we'll hit the point where, you know, we'll, we'll hit the crossing the chasm moment where we'll, this will all make sense. Hmm. Sounds absolutely wonderful. I'm, I'm, uh, um, one, one question like that, that occurs from that last comment, though, is you've got 19 shopping centers, and what, that's a fabulous sort of sure. visual image that you've got these shopping centers that are growing on the roof, the vegetables that they sell downstairs, right? Which sure, effect, sure. effectively. But you, what you were told that you should forget about it, that came out of the challenge of actually building the building on the rooftop, right? Sure. sure. And so do, are you going to have to go to each of those 19 shopping centers and kind of rebuild substantial pieces of them to support this? Sure. Yeah. As it stands today, that is the major challenge. Is when you're looking at new construction, you're able to work with the engineers and the architects to design the building so it, it, it meets the demand. But when you're looking at existing structures, very few existing structures are capable of, of handling the loads and the infrastructure of a farm without any retrofitting. So yes, you can retrofit them, but it's typically a very expensive and very, uh, you know, it's not a very simple process. Uh, but there's a lot of new cities that are being built. There's a lot of new shopping centers being built. A lot of new shopping centers, there are a lot of shopping centers that are being revamped. And, and the key is for us is to intercept these projects early on before they're executed, before they're planned, and, 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 and join the, the engineering team so we can design the farm right from the get-go. Are you getting any interest from the major food companies, like I'm thinking, thinking Loblaws and Sobeys and so forth? Because it seems to me, if I were, were running one of those, I would be saying, even if it didn't make, you know, even if it didn't make sense in all these other kinds of ways, just the image of having the greenhouse on the roof of my store and people downstairs knowing that the, that the uh, cucumbers sure. came from upstairs, isn't that a, wouldn't that be a tremendously sexy concept? Sure, it, it certainly would sure? be. Do but they see that? I mean, absolutely. We've had a lot of interest from, from, from the folks in the food industry. Uh, I know there's, there's a number of companies uh, in the same space with a similar model where they want to build greenhouses on top of, of grocery stores. We actually believe that it's, it's fairly challenging. Uh, mainly because what the consumption of a grocery store does not necessarily match the production output of a farm. Uh, I think we uh, uh, one discussion I had with a with a uh, with a fairly large store where they were telling me that they sell a couple of hundred heads of lettuce per day, and we we harvest a couple of thousand heads of lettuce per day, <laughs> or we we have that. I mean, so there's a mismatch between what what you can produce and what you what you need to sell, and and I, we think we really like the way we're doing distribution because it does require our customers to really become partners in this project and commit. When they commit, we have certain certainty in how we need to sell our food. So we know that when we harvest the tomatoes, that they're going to you know, customer A, customer B, and, and that creates a very a good level of, of consistency and it really eliminates waste because you've got a, you've got a commitment on, on each end. And, uh, and that model really works well and it also gives us uh, a great it, it, I mean, we get a feedback from our customers on, on every basket we, 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 we sell. We, we, they tell us if they liked it, what they didn't like, what they'd like to see change, the different cultivars, they give us suggestions for recipes, and quickly we can start connecting customers together and create a bit of a community where people can exchange ideas. Uh, and we see that happening naturally at our drop-off sites where uh, we have some drop-off sites that have over 100 subscribers. So you can imagine 100 people rushing in you know, uh, between 3 and 6 p.m. to pick up their baskets. Well, guess what happens? A lot of times they're, they're exchanging phone numbers, exchanging emails, recipes. Sometimes they're exchanging vegetables. And, and there's just a sense of community that, that, that takes place. And that's, that's just some of the things that, that we believe are essential when you're, when you're farming locally. Uh, you need, your food is no longer a commodity. It, it, your food has personality. And you're actually creating a community on the other side of the equation too, with, by, by bringing in things from other farms sure. and cheeses, and I suppose could be wine even, but uh, but uh, you know a whole range of, uh, of different kinds of food. Sure, so you're building a culture. Uh, absolutely, I think we Quebec is, is really interesting because people don't, don't when they think of Quebec, they don't think of a lot of food being produced locally, and it's really not true. Uh, there's some amazing treasures being grown in Quebec. I mean, we have some of the best foods here, uh, and I think the climate really helps 
contribute to that. The problem has always been that it's very, very hard for these farmers who adore farming, they, that their passion is farming. It's been very hard for them to become truck drivers and, 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 and to, to, you know, to go down to Montreal and to Quebec City and sell their foods. So they haven't really been able to grow their businesses because they haven't had the market. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as, as our, our marketplace really representing an online farmer's market where uh, we showcase uh, all the treasures of Quebec that we've discovered and, and, and essentially it's a, it's, it's a direct link with, uh, with Lufa and, and the partner farm. So you know who the potatoes are coming from. Our potatoes come from Mario Bissette, who's uh, in the Laurentians. He has about 100 acres in the Laurentians and he's, uh, I like to call him steak and fries because he grows beef and he has a lot of potatoes. <laughs> but uh, we've been working with Mario for three years and he went from farming one acre to farming two acres to now soon farming four acres for the Lufa baskets. So we, and, and, and prior to that, he, he farmed very, very little potatoes and it was for a very local, very, uh, very, very concise market. Uh, so if we can do more of that, we can quickly start promoting local across, you know, across the entire spectrum from the potato farmer to the carrot farmer to the beef farmer to the dairy farmer. And then, and then on, the to on top of that, there's a tremendous number of food artisans that are just magnificent. I mean, our, our baker, um, uh, we, we get our bread from a bakery called La Batapin, which is just a, a couple of kilometers away from our farm. And, and, and that bakery is a pure... When I first uh, had my first piece of bread there, I just fell in love. And, and the owner is a chef that created the bakery because he couldn't find bread, amazing bread, to serve in his restaurant. So he said, I'm just going to make my own. And he started La Batapin. And they make amazing breads. And for me, that's a treasure. And that treasure is inaccessible to all the people in Montreal because it's, it's, it's in a small area. So by, 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 by bringing it to our marketplace, uh, we become a, a good venue uh, for La Batapa, and we're able to connect uh, the rest of Montreal to this amazing treasure. Yeah. There's a farm, I think, called Tournesol on the West Island somewhere. And it, my, my memory is that it consists of three couples or something like that, and who've set up this farm together as a kind of a corporation. So that the, 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 by farming with three couples, you get away from the curse of farming, which is you've got to be there all the time. I've never heard of, of this farm. I and mean, we work with about 40, 50 different food producers. Uh, but, and we're looking to, to, to build that up. I think for us, the, the criteria is uh, you have to be either organic certified or use no pesticides or herbicides or fungicides. So you have to share the same vision as LUFA. You have to have safe foods. Yeah. And, and just, uh, it's so true that in farming, you really can't escape you know, it's a seven day job, You're, it's like operating a hospital, you have to tend to, or a daycare, you have to really tend to your, your children. Technology allows you to escape. Uh, it, it's really interesting because we monitor our farm remotely all the time, and it allows us to go on vacation, allows us to be on the beach, and have our iPad, and just look at the temperature, look at the weather, uh, cameras to look at the plants. Um, that's another really area where uh, technology has been very helpful. And people hear it all the time too, because you're spreading it out over a, quite a large group of sure. people. Right? Absolutely. How many yeah. people? Are so that we, we have, I think the company has over 30 people right now. We've got about 15 that, that I like to think of as they're working on the future. <laughs> they're working on, on improving the model, expanding the model. Um, they're really the, the folks that are dedicated to getting, making this a phenomenon. And we've got about 15 people that are in the operations, from farming to distribution, uh, customer service, et cetera, et cetera. You've got half your resources committed to research and development, effectively. Research right? and development and corporate development, yes. Yeah. 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 That's a very high proportion. Absolutely. And I think we, we, we always look at Lufa as a technology company. You know, we, 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 we're just starting. Uh, we, there's so many more improvements we can bring uh, from, from choice of cultivar to, to the growing methods to even just making the experience more user-friendly for our customers. I mean, we. I remember, uh, you know, there was this one moment where one one subscriber came in, and he said uh, he was really frustrated. They were he was picking up a basket here at Lufa, and he was very very frustrated. He said, "I came in here and I wanted to park, and I couldn't find a parking spot." He said, "You know, I don't. You know, even if your veggies are amazing, even if you're saving the world and saving Africa, if you can't put a parking spot here, I will cancel my subscription." And my first reflex was like, oh my God, you know, here we are, you know, working seven days a week, we're exhausted, we're tired, we're trying to innovate, trying to change the world, and you're telling me about parking. And, and it was infuriating. And then quickly it occurred to me that he's right. You know, for, for, if we want to make this a phenomenon, we have to be able to bring people what they need. We, we can't just tell people, you know, sign up to LUFA, support LUFA. No, we have to, people need to be buying this because it's better, because it's better food, it's better tasting, it's better quality, it's better value.
You know, uh, I think Elon Musk said, I don't want people to buy my car because it's electric. I want them to buy it because it's an amazing car. So that's kind of how we see ourselves. And that's why we've got 15 people dedicated to improving that experience and making it, making it really uh, magic. This is a geek's corporate model, right? <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. <laughs> we're, we're all geeks at heart. We all love technology. We're all programmers. and we <laughs> your, your future is the whole world. Um, but you are, and you're taking very rapid steps to grow even now. Eh? Tell me about how you see it rolling out. Sure. I mean, we, we, we're at a point now. I, I always like to take different industries as, as a comparison. I like to compare what we're doing today to the electric. Sometimes we think of what we're doing as the electric the electric car of agriculture to, to a certain extent. And we're at a stage right now where we've, we've got the concept, uh, we've, we've proven the concept to a certain extent, but we're not yet ready for rolling it in, in, in masses, if I can say. I think we, we still have to demonstrate certain, uh, certain steps before this really could, we, before we can go out to uh, the world and say, you know, this is change your, the rules for developments of new building. Every new building must include a rooftop, uh, rooftop greenhouse. So I think we're, we're at a point where we still have a, n a number of demonstrations to make. Uh, we have to show that the concept is expandable in multiple cities. We have to show that we can get to the point where we're feeding, you know, five, 10, 20 percent of a city uh, with with this with this model. Uh, but for us. The, the future is to, to see this expanding in every single city. I mean, we more and more people are living in cities, uh, and, and this is where, this is for us, uh, it just makes a lot of sense. I think w over the next five years, we still have a lot of work to demonstrate the technology, but eventually our goal is to change, our vision is the city of rooftop farms. We want to make sure that, that cities understand that this is the way to develop sustainably, and, and for, for consumers to, to realize that, yes, we can get our food locally. It's in, the, in the immediate future, you've got, so you've got farm number one in Montreal, farm number two in Montreal, farm number three in Montreal, or? We're, we're hoping farm number three will actually be in Boston. We've got a team in Boston, of two people in Boston that are dedicated to uh, getting the projects up and running in Boston. We looked at Boston primarily because it's a very similar city to Montreal. We have a number of our team members and founding members that are from Boston. Um, so we look at Boston as really the next, the next city we want to expand in. It's interesting because you also you, you obviously have a very international flavor among your people. You've got a, <coughs> a group of people brought together by ideas, visions, and interests, right? I'm a big believer that you live in the world. You know, you don't live in. in, in I mean, uh, I think we're, we have to understand that this for this to make to be to happen, you have to bring in people from all over the world. When we, whenever we take a group picture, it looks like a commercial for United Colors of Benetton. <laughs> Just <laughs> you've got everyone represented in there, and and I and we all love it because it, it brings in new ideas, new ways of doing things. And when it comes down to expansion, it really simplifies things because we literally have a person uh, in every single expansion city that we want to be in. Uh, we've got folks from Boston, we've got folks from France, we've got folks from uh, Chicago, uh, Toronto. Um, so it, it really helps from that perspective as well. Are those the next cities? I was going to say, what's city number three, what's city number four? I, I think for the time being, our focus is, is getting Boston up and running. I think once, there's a number of cities that would be rolled up after that, but we still haven't, you know, we haven't really finalized, you know, that, that, that portion of our expansion yet. Our focus is really to get Montreal growing. We have a lot of projects here in Montreal, Montreal and, and surroundings, but also in Boston. Yeah, and you're going, to, you're going to need in every city that network of people that can connect you with the other food artisans that will share the basket. Right? Sure, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small team in every city, uh, but the plant science team really remains centralized here. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's how we will be. It's a fascinating thing, isn't it? Because in, in the one sense, it's very centralized in that, in that sense. Sure. And in another sense, it's very decentralized. I mean, you've got to find another baker sure. in Boston. Absolutely, right, you know? absolutely, and, for sure. And in Toronto. And, and in the flavors are very different. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the language is very different. Yes. Uh, but that's what makes, I mean, <laughs> eat local, think global. <laughs> it's just <laughs> act local, think. This is really a great example. I mean, some things are just done better on a global scale. Uh, I, sometimes I like to think of what we're doing in, in, from a farming perspective is, is we're, we're bringing to farming what, what Starbucks brought to coffee. You know, a very standardized way uh, of doing things where you, know, you, you, you come up with the best processes, the best methods, the best software, the best tools, the best communications. But then uh, on, the, on the food distribution side, it's incredibly local. You know, it's, it's hyper local. <laughs> And even in the decisions as to what to grow. Sure, sure. I mean, when we launched this project, we, we, we had three rows of eggplants, you know, because I'm Lebanese. 
And then I quickly realized I'm, I'm, there's not that many Lebanese people. <laughs> but our, our system automatically adapts. If we, if we don't sell as many eggplants, we grow less eggplants. So we're able to adapt to every single city that we're in based on, on the, very, the, micro, uh, the micro requirements there. Is there either now or possibly in the future any public component to this where, because uh, it would make sense for a government to say, yeah, we'd like to see this happen, it makes sense for all kinds of ways, we'll give you a bit of an incentive, we'll give you a tax break, whatever, anything like that on the horizon? One of the you know, challenges and opportunities that we've had is, is in this first farm, we, we have no tax breaks. I think we, we, we pay, pay taxes right now as if we were, we pay about 20 times more taxes than per square, mo square meter, square foot, than a traditional farm does. Uh, so we're being taxed as if we have an office in here because this is to date not considered a farm by, 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 by the evaluators. And it's, it's been a bit of a challenge because it doesn't create a level uh, playing field because we, we're, we have higher expenses to be able to operate an innovative projects in the heart of the city. Uh, we're seeing cities like Boston, New York that are, that are really starting to think of how can they promote uh, urban farming. Uh, creating incentives in place, uh, eliminating any, any taxation on, on urban farms because they understand that farming is not necessarily, you know, it's not like running an IT business. The capacity to pay these taxes is, is, is not necessarily the same. Uh, so, so this project, we've had to do it uh, financially independently, but in a way it's been good because it's, it's really forced us to uh, look at our efficiencies and create a form of agriculture that's truly independent. I mean, the first rule of sustainability, in my opinion, is financial independence. If you're not profitable, you are not sustainable. And I know it doesn't apply perfectly because there are some uh, inequalities in the model, but uh, mostly the price of fossil fuels skew the entire equation. But, but the, for me, this project has to be financially viable. And, and without, without incentives, without help. And if there are incentives, obviously we'll benefit from them, we'll take them, but we're, we're, we're confident that, that you can, by farming locally and by reducing the inputs and having a direct link with the customer, this type of farming works even without incentive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it might help you to grow faster. Absolutely, right. for sure. What about basically the scientific research tax credits? Are those of any benefit? The R&D credits in, in Canada, I think it's a great program because it allows you to really, which is one of the reasons why we invest in technology. I mean, if we were in the U.S., you know, I know certain states might have similar credits, but uh, it might not be the same scenario. I think Canada's really done a great, uh, great thing by setting up these R&D credits because it allows people to, you know, hire a science team, uh, invest in technology, and invest in, pro in projects that, that can be exported throughout the world. And, and I think we, uh, by creating our network operations center and the software package that will manage our farms, we'll be able to set ourselves aside uh, by, by having done this. And, and I think being able to, to benefit from, from, from R&D credits is, is definitely a great plus. Mohammed Hayes, the youthful visionary who's created the first rooftop farm in the world. If you enjoyed this interview, you may also want to look at our interview with Brian Brett, the poet philosopher who wrote Trauma Farm, a rebel history of rural life, or our conversation with Vandana Shiva, head of Navdanya, a remarkable network of seed keepers and organic producers in India. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Please join us again soon.